uh, guests, colleagues and students, good evening and welcome. Uh, these lectures have drawn a large contingent of regular friends over the past 14 years. But for those who don't already know, I'm Professor Edward Peck, I'm the Vice-Chancellor of Nottingham Trent University. And our speaker this evening is the author, not executive director, policy advisor, and former investment backer, Dr. Philip Ogar. Now, Philip graduated from Cambridge in 1979 with a PhD in history. Uh, and his thesis title was The Cotton Famine, 1861-2065, a study of the cotton towns during the American Civil War, which would make a, a fascinating lecture, I think, in its, in its own right. After that, he went into career in finance when he joined Nat West in London as equities broker. And then he went on positions in the mid-90s before moving to join J. Henry Scroder. Uh, he would be part of the team that negotiated the sale of Schroeder's investment bank, Citigroup, for a reported £1.35 billion. In 2000, he left the sector and has since been speaking, writing, and broadcasting about the challenges of modern capitalism and, of course, the challenges of banking. He's written six books, including the very widely acclaimed Death of Gentleman Capitalism in 2000, and his latest work, The Bank That Lived a Little, Barclays in the Age of a Very Free Market. He contributes regularly to Financial Times, other publications, and appears regularly on BBC Radio, particularly the Today programme, and on television. He's also held a number of advisory and non-executive positions, including those of non-executive board member at the Department for Education from 2004-2010, and a similar role in the Hove offices between 2010 and 2014. He was a member of the Cross-Party Future of Banking Commission, chaired by David Davis in 2010, and the same year he advised the Scottish Parliament's inquiry into the banking crisis. Now, more recently, he was the chair of the Review of Post-18 Education and Funding, on which I was a panel member. And so working closely with Philip for the best part of 18 months, and I read a couple of his books along the way, and they're very good. I learned he's a deft exponent of the fine art of understatement and an extension of that particular skill of leaving things unsaid. So we're all going to have to listen very carefully to what I know will be a lecture that is as engaging as it is erudite. During his immense experience of what our bank's been up to for almost 40 years, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Philip Ogar to present this evening's distinguished lecture. Should we trust our banks, Philip? Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for giving up um, part of your evening, a very wet evening, to attend this lecture. Thank you very much to Edward for those generous words of introduction. Uh, and particularly thank you to Nottingham Trent for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm looking forward to it a lot. I like to think about banking as being a vital subject, an interesting subject. It can even be an, an entertaining subject, and I will try to fill all of those criteria over the next 30, 40 minutes. Edward gave you a bit of my story. Um, I'd just like to explain really how it is that I come to be here. And it was in the 1990s, and it was when I worked for NatWest and then Schroders. And part of my job was to go around with the chief executive of NatWest, which at the time was one of the top four UK banks. And we would speak to investors. He would speak to investors. I would really open the door and carry his bag for him, frankly. But as I was doing that, it occurred to me that the, what, what we were actually doing was, was not entirely what the chief executive was describing to investors, to shareholders. We said we were doing one thing, but actually we were doing something slightly different. And I started to, nothing, nothing illegal, nothing incorrect, but there was more risk in the business than was apparent in our discussions with shareholders. And I began to feel somewhat uncomfortable about finance. I moved to another bank, Schroeder's, in the late 90s to see whether a different business model would make me feel different, differently about banking. It didn't. And at that point in 1998, I decided to quit my job. I got a book deal with Penguin Books, and for the last 20 years, as Edward described, I've been writing, speaking, thinking about banking, about the role it plays in society, what it does for customers, 
for shareholders, for employees, and for society at large. And that really is the theme of this evening's lecture, Should We Trust Our Banks? I'm going to talk really, there are four sections to this talk, um, and it will be pretty apparent where my sympathies lie once we get into this. The four parts really are, are this. First of all, why we shouldn't trust our banks. Secondly, why, although we might not like them very much, we actually have to trust them. And those two sections will be the bulk of this talk. The last two sections will consider what has changed since the banking crisis of 2007 to 9, because stuff has changed. And finally, I will t talk about why, even though things have changed, we need to remain vigilant. So this is the first section, why we should not trust our banks. And in this section, there, there are three reasons why we should not trust our banks. The first of them is that banks can be reckless. I'm holding up here a copy of my book on the financial crisis. Um, I chose reckless as the title because I think that was one of, the, one of the reasons why the banks did get us into trouble. That's the book. Note the colour. It's red. We'll come on to that in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to talk about why the banks are reckless. I'm going to talk a bit about something called the bezel. I'm going to talk a bit about the mistakes that banks made. The combination of recklessness, the bezel, and their propensity to make mistakes combines to make them, in fact, uh, quite a dangerous kind of animal. So first of all, reckless behaviour. And you'll see this on the screen behind me. It's a quote from the BBC uh, website, 14th of September 2007. Northern Rock shares plunged 32%. Shares in one of the UK's largest mortgage lenders, Northern Rock, have fallen 32% after it had to ask the Bank of England for emergency funding. But experts and officials insist that Northern Rock, which has £113 billion of assets, is not in danger of going bust. Despite the reassurances, Lines of customers formed outside many Northern Rock branches around the UK. Those cues are one of the iconic images, really, of the banking crisis. I think until then, we all assumed that banks were really rather boring, that they were safe, that not much could go wrong if we left our money with them. Maybe they didn't pay us enough interest, maybe they charged us a bit too much for loans, but they were safe, they were boring. We didn't really want to, want to bother about them. When I started writing about banking in 1999, I had a great job to persuade anyone really to be interested in it. It was, was considered a, an item of no interest to the general public. It's something that we take for granted. Why are you doing that, people said. This is just going to be very, very uninteresting. That moment, actually, the queues outside the branches of Northern Rock, the sight of pensioners turning up with plastic carrier bags to put their life savings in them because they thought the bank was going to go bust, that is something that fundamentally changed uh, our perception, the public's perception of banks. We understood for the first time that banks could be reckless, that they could be dangerous. Now, the Prime Minister at the time was Gordon Brown, and he had been Chancellor of the Exchequer for a long time. His ambition, he made little secret of it, was to succeed Tony Blair as PM. He had been a cheerleader of finance on the way up in the 90s and the 2000s, but he was very quick to realise the risks that an overblown financial system brought to the UK. Quite soon after he'd become Prime Minister, Northern Rock happened, and with, within a few months, he realised how risky the banks could be. This is a quote from him in 2008. If the banks are shutting their doors, and the cash points aren't working, and people go to Tesco, and their cards aren't being accepted, the whole thing will just explode. If you can't buy food, or petrol, or medicine for your kids, 
People will just start breaking the windows and helping themselves. It'll be anarchy. I'm serious. We'd have to think, do we have curfews? Do we put the army on the street? How do we get order back? So that was 2008, 11 years ago, and those, these times are already fading into the memory. There will be first-year undergraduates, second-year undergraduates at Nottingham Trent University for whom the queues outside Northern Rock, the prospect of cash points not working, people breaking windows, will be something just that they've, had to, that they've read about, that their parents have told them about. Memories fade very quickly. But these words were a reminder, actually, of how dangerous banks can be, how reckless behaviour can lead to great risks for not just the economy, but for society at large. By October 2008, the risks that Gordon Brown identified had become very real. Our big banks were in danger of going bust. Not just one or two of them, but the really big boys were struggling. They were struggling to fund themselves overnight. They were struggling to find money to fill the cash machines. They were struggling to find money to refinance themselves. Gordon Brown was Prime Minister by this time, and his point man on this, the Chancellor, was his fellow Scot, Alistair Darling. And they were actually a very good combination because although Gordon Brown had been a, a cheerleader for finance on the way up, he very quickly realised the perilous position that the world was in once the crisis hit. Alistair Darling was a different man without that instinctive understanding of finance that Gordon Brown had, but a very calm, measured Scots lawyer. And I now want to turn to some words of his to illustrate the next point. And I'm quoting from uh, Alistair Darling's book, Back from, the Brink, which is a, Back from the Brink, which is a very nice piece of work. He wrote there, On a wet Tuesday morning, on 11 October 2008, I took a call from Sir Tom McKillop, chairman of RBS, whose headquarters is in the city in which I live. He told me his bank would collapse within hours. What was I going to do about it? So I've tried to show here that banks are important. I've tried to show here that reckless behaviour had put them in a perilous position and that that perilous position, in turn, put the country into a perilous position. So the second thing I want to talk about in this section, that's reckless, the second thing is the bezel. And I want to turn now to... Um, the book that I and I think every other financial writer wishes they had written. It's by the great American economist J.K. Galbraith, and it's called The Great Crash. He's a lovely writer. He wrote it in 1955, just after a series of congressional hearings into the perils of Wall Street and big banking. And I thought I'd just start off by reading um, his description of how he came to write the book. On the 21st of April 1955, the book was finally published. The publisher had some, had some months before decided that the volume needed a good, strong jacket. This turned out to be a bright and very visible red. I told you you'd need that one again. With this colour and all the excitement of the preceding weeks, it seemed certain that the interest in the book would be overwhelming. In the end, the response was admirable, but the early market was very orderly, indeed depressingly so. One evening I was coming through the old LaGuardia terminal on my way to Boston, and I paused, as usual, to eye the window of the little bookshop on the way to the ramp. It's something that everyone who's written a book, and I know a number of you in the audience have done that, it's something that everyone does. We stop at the bookshop and see if we can see our own book there. Galbraith's experience is actually rather like mine. He carries on. As usual, there was no sign of the bright red jacket. The lady asked me if I wanted something, and I summoned all my resources of courage and said, I seem to remember a lot of recent discussion about a book. I forget the name of the author, uh, maybe Galbraith, but I think it was called The Great Crash. She replied, 
that's certainly not a title you could sell in an airport. <laughs> so that's, the, that's how Galbraith starts his book. But what really interested me in the book, apart from his wonderful analysis of how financial systems go wrong, and this is about the crash of 1929, remember, it's, the, it's this word, the bezel. And I will read a bit more from his book. He's such a lovely writer. To the economist, embezzlement is the most interesting of crimes. Alone among the various forms of larceny, it has a time parameter. Weeks, months, or years may elapse between the commission of the crime and its discovery. This is the period, incidentally, when the embezzler has his gain and the man who has been embezzled, oddly enough, feels no loss. There is a net increase in psychic wealth. At any given time, there exists an inventory of undisclosed embezzlement in, or more precisely not in, the country's businesses and banks. This inventory, it should perhaps be called the bezel, amounts at any moment to many millions of dollars. Well, the millions of dollars in 1955 had turned to billions of dollars, obviously, by the 2000s. But it's a very interesting notion, the bezel. And I want to talk a bit now about the bezel in banking. How do, how do they do it? And I want to talk about a character I've called in my latest book, The Bank That Lived a Little, a character who I've called Carl Edwards. It's a pseudonym. His name is, is something different, but he's absolutely a real person. And every word in this um, I heard from Carl. Carl was... Um, a small Birmingham businessman. In the, in the 80s, um, when he was still at school, he developed an interest in forms of American music. He found it very hard to get the records. He learned how he could buy them from America, sell them to the Birmingham public, and he began to build a small business. He lived with his parents in their council house in a rough part of Birmingham. He started to store the records in the spare room of their, of their house, and it began to work really well. He started to build a substantial business. He rented some premises in the centre of Birmingham, and he started to get visitors to this shop and started to really develop quite a nice little line. He rented a shop, shop did very well, he decided that he would really like to buy something, and so he wanted to buy a warehouse. He'd started doing his banking with Barclays Bank, and so the obvious place to go when he wanted his mortgage was to the local branch. Branch received him quite well, asked him a few questions, gave him a form, gave him, gave him the money for the mortgage. He moved into the warehouse. Business continued to develop very well, and he became quite a good customer of Barclays. If times got hard, he needed some help with cash flow, they'd advance him some money. they do his forex transactions. He deposited quite a lot of money with them. It's becoming a very close relationship. And really, it was in many respects at this point how banking really should be. In fact, um, by... 19, the late 1990s, he was a very good customer of Barclays. And he was busy in his office selling records one day when he received a surprising call from his bank, from his bank manager. Carl, said the bank manager, I want you to take a look at a competition we're running. The closing date is tonight. It won't take you a moment. I really think you should do it now. Carl said, oh, sorry, I, I haven't got time for this. I'm selling records. There's a lot going on. No, no, said the bank manager. You've absolutely got to do it. Carl filled out the form, sent his, sent his entry off, thought nothing more of it, until a couple of weeks later, he took another call from the, bank, from the banking manager. Good news, Carl, 
You remember that competition you entered? You've won first prize, an all-expenses-paid trip to New York, business class flights for you and your wife, spending money, and three nights in the Four Seasons Hotel in Manhattan. How does that sound? Well, of course, it sounded pretty good to Carl. It was uh, all he'd ever wanted to do. Clearly, it forged an even closer relationship with the bank that he was beginning to trust. And he began to depend on them more and more. They did more and more business. Now I want to move forward to 2007. Now he needs a bigger warehouse and he needs a bigger mortgage. October 2007. Carl Edwards had at last found a warehouse that fitted his needs. It was time to discuss a new mortgage. He phoned his relationship manager at Barclays, who he now regarded as a friend. He trusted the bank to look after his interests, and Barclays evidently considered him a good customer. The relationship manager was pleased to help with the mortgage and agreed to come round to Carl's office to discuss the details. Carl was surprised to find not one, but two visitors from Barclays turning up at his door. The relationship manager introduced Carol, a smartly dressed woman in a dark suit who he described as part of the team. That was only partly true. Carol worked for Barclays Capital, the investment bank, in the Birmingham regional office with the title of corporate risk manager. After Carl's relationship manager had taken down a few details about the new loan, Carol asked Carl if he had considered what would happen if, as many economists were predicting, interest rates rose from their current level of 5%. Would his business be able to meet the increased interest payments on the loan he wanted to take out? Carl said that he was confident about his business, that he never believed in overstretching, and the sum he wanted to borrow was well within his means. Carol turned on her laptop, clicked on a file. It was a presentation headed, Interest Rate Risk Management, Corporate Risk Advisory, Barclays Capital. And that was the moment when Carl's life went badly wrong. Because what happened was not that interest rates went up. Interest rates, as we all know, went down from 5% to about half a percent. Carl hadn't read the small print, and the small print hadn't been explained to him. Because in the small print, it said that if interest rates went down, Carl had to pay Barclays money. So if interest rates went up, Carl was protected, but if interest rates went down, he was penalised and had to pay the bank money. He had just bought an interest rate derivative, which would in fact ruin his business. As interest rates started to fall, he began to receive quarterly demands for thousands of pounds. The numbers built up. Eventually, he had to put the business that he'd built from his parents' spare bedroom into a big business employing 30-odd people. He had to put that into administration. He was absolutely ruined. It was part of a national scandal, the interest rate hedging product scandal. Barclays was not the only bank to have been participating in this. They all were. Carl had been, and all the others, had been bezel. It was a classic case of what Galbraith described in the, in, in the book. In the end, it turned out that the banks had to pay $2.4 billion of restitution to customers that they had effectively defrauded. But actually, it wasn't the biggest bezel that took place in the banking crisis. The biggest bezel, as I'm sure you will be aware, was PPI. This turned out to be a £50 billion bezel. That is the running total that the banks have had to pay to customers for restitution. PPI, for those of you who who haven't bought it, is a form of, it's called Sansa Payment Protection Insurance. And it was an insurance policy that borrowers were encouraged to take out by banks um, as protection for ill health or unemployment or various other circumstances. The scandal is this, 
that PPI was frequently sold to borrowers who were self-employed, unemployed, or retired, all of which were exclusions in the policy. It frequently included selling to those with an existing pre-medical condition, which was another exclusion. The impression was given to many borrowers that if you wanted to take out a loan from the bank, PPI was compulsory. The last of these, there's a way in which the cost of the insurance policy was added to the loan right up front, which increased the amount of loan you had to take out and increased the interest rate you had to pay. And finally, there was a trick which many banks ran, which was that you were automatically made to buy PPI when you took out your loan, unless you ticked a box. Those are two examples of the bezel. Those are two examples of why, historically, we shouldn't trust our banks. So we've dealt with recklessness. We've dealt with the bezel. Let's turn to the third of the reasons why we shouldn't trust our banks. Those of you that have played the board game Monopoly will know that there's one card in it. I don't know what the amount is, but when I played it, if you were lucky, you got a card that said, a bank error in your favour, collect £200. The problem actually is that the bank error is never in your favour. And the example I want to give here is and it's, just, it's one I've been talking about a lot, a lot recently on the radio and in the, in the media. It's the, the TSB IT meltdown of last year. This was a case when, IT, when TSB were converting from one banking platform to another to give their customers, they hoped, better service, and perhaps they will in due course. But the meltdown meant that um, over a long period, uh, uh, several days, 1.9 million customers were affected, effectively unable to use their banking services. Weddings were, redding, weddings were ruined. House, pu house, price pu house purchases were frozen. Um, everyone was hugely inconvenienced. It wasn't an intentional act by TSB, far from it. It was just an, an error and it illustrates, actually, I felt that the TSB experience, 1.9 million customers affected over a period of several days, illustrates how utterly dependent we are on our banks. It's absolutely essential that these things work properly, but we can't totally rely on them because they are human. Frailty exists, and, and in this technologically enabled age, things can and do go wrong. So that's really the first part of, of what I want to talk about, why we should not trust our banks. We shouldn't trust them because they can be reckless. We shouldn't trust them because they are prone to the bezel. We shouldn't trust them because they are prone to error. And if there's an error, it can be very damaging. But there is also a sense, and now onto the second part of this talk, there is also a sense in which we absolutely have to trust our banks. And that too emerged in the financial crisis. One of the things that Edward mentioned, Professor Peck mentioned um, in the introduction, I, I sat on, something, on the Future of Banking Commission in 2008, a cross-party uh, inquiry into um, what was wrong with banking. And I want to quote some evidence that we took from one particular witness. The witness said, one of the things that seems to be slightly odd about banks is if you look at social and economic institutions, it's very hard to think of any that does anything that is more useful. The witness went on to say, they take surplus savings from people who don't really know what they particularly want to do with them at any particular moment and convert that into loans to households who may wish to buy a property or to businesses that need finance for investment. Take surplus savings from people who don't really know what to do with those surplus savings, convert those loans into households who might want to buy a property or to businesses that need finance for investment. And it's a really interesting point because, as the witness said, 
if we didn't have banks prepared to engage in that kind of maturity transformation. That's what this process is called. The only people who would be able to invest in business or buy houses would be people who'd inherited vast amounts of wealth. So there is, in a sense, banks, in a sense, are an equalizing force. I wonder whether anyone has been able to identify or who knows who said that. Put your hand up if you can. No. It's a very curious form of diction, and you'll, you'll probably recognize the voice when I show who it was. It was Robert Peston. And Robert went on to say, it is absolutely extraordinary given all this useful stuff they do, that their reputation is unbelievably poor. Robert, um, to some degree, made his name as a broadcaster during the banking crisis. It was he who broke the Northern Rock story. He commented on it um, regularly with authority and in great depth during the crisis. And I think this piece of evidence to the, to the Future of Banking Commission was absolutely spot on. It, tells you why we absolutely have to trust our banks. Without them, society would gum up. They're a source, they're a source of great social and economic fluidity and mobility. They are really important institutions. So we've learned, I hope, or I've tried to show why we, why we shouldn't trust our banks, yet I've also tried to show you why we absolutely have to trust them. Now, the, bank, the bankers would say, of course, that my evidence is anecdotal and historic and that things have changed greatly, that everything has changed since the crisis. Well, things have changed since the crisis. Here are half a dozen ways in which they have changed. First of all, the penalties that have been imposed on banks worldwide are bound to change behaviour. The total of fines levied on global banks since the crisis is £400 billion. It's paid effectively by shareholders. And that huge sum of money forces shareholders to put pressure on executives, on boards of directors, to be careful in what they do. We don't want anything like this again, is a common um, refrain from shareholders. So that, I think, is bound to make a difference. The second thing that has changed is that the incentive structure on bankers themselves has changed considerably. When I was writing about Carl and Carol, I completely understand Carol's behaviour. I don't blame Carol for selling Carl that interest rate hedge. I completely get that. She joined Barclays uh, as a school leaver. She had a a normal kind of life, lived a, with a, a mortgage and sensible holidays. And she, but she had a very demanding, very stretching targets. And if she could sell products like an interest rate hedge, she would get a bonus that would actually be a life-changing sum. She could, if not pay off her mortgage, certainly pay for that year's holiday. and make, It would make a real difference. And if she sold that product, she was allowed to keep the money. The bank could not claim it back if things then went, went wrong. It was a kind of take your money and run game. And if it was true of Carol, it was true even more so of the bosses at the tops of the banks, the people earning millions, sometimes tens of millions of pounds for driving profits up. They were able to deliver the profits, get their bonuses, genuinely life-changing sums of money, 10 million, 20 million bonuses, leave the bank and keep the money if everything went wrong. That has now changed. All of these big bonuses now have in them clawback arrangements. So if you sell a product to a customer and it then turns wrong, goes wrong, you have to pay the money back to the, back to the bank. It's a big, big change. The third big change is something with a rather tedious technical-sounding title, the senior manager's regime. Amazingly, during the banking crisis, it was never entirely clear who was in charge. It was always slightly woolly. That's why the authorities haven't actually been able to really land any big banking targets. There, hasn't been, there haven't been any real, really senior bankers um, tried and convicted 
as a result of the crisis. The senior manager's regime is going to change that. From now on, banks have to have wiring diagrams showing exactly who is responsible for which product line. They can be tied, they can be tied to it. They carry the can. Another big change. The banks are safer than they were too, much, much safer now than they were before the crisis. They have to hold more capital for against a rainy day. It's a much different industry. Significantly, and I go back, heart back here to the Northern Rock crisis, now the retail parts of a bank, the consumer business, the high street business, is ring-fenced is a separate subsidiary with separate reporting lines and separate capital structure from the rest of the bank. There is no risk now of a high-risk investment bank bringing down um, the kind of retail bank where you and I leave our money. And finally, I think there has been a change in the dynamic in business. The kind of behaviour that, that drove me out of banking in the 1990s and the kind of behaviour, the philosophy that encouraged bank managements to drive their businesses very hard in the 2000s were due to the shareholder value movement. The movement first exposed, espoused by Milton Friedman and others, um, epitomised by the chief executive of GE, Jack Welsh, Neutron Jack, he was called, the idea that business had to be run primarily, totally, for the interest of the shareholders. And that philosophy dominated business throughout the, throughout the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. As long as you made money for the shareholders, everything was fine. Interestingly, and it's only a recent change. The last three or four years, we've seen quite a swing away from shareholder value into a more rounded business philosophy, stakeholder value, where you now run the business, not just for shareholders, but in the interests of other stakeholders too. Customers, employees, suppliers, the wider economy, the planet. A book I really admire... Um, was written in 1995 by the economist Will Hutton, The State We're In. And Will Hutton developed this, st the, the, the stakeholder management theory at that time. Great book, great ideas, sold a lot, no one really took any notice of it. I just see it detect a real change in the last three or four years. The most, the hardest edged proponents of shareholder value is a group called the Business Roundtable in the US. This is where the big business CEOs sit. Amazingly, and they've been the cheerleaders of, of shareholder value right the way through. Amazingly, earlier this year, they acknowledged that shareholder value wasn't just about short-term profits, that these wider interests needed to be taken account of as well. And actually, interestingly, Jack Welsh, Neutron Jack himself, now describes um, shareholder value as the dumbest idea that there ever was. A bit late, but thanks, Jack. So a lot has changed, and I think we have reasons to be more trusting of our banks than we were. But I also think we have to remain ever vigilant and I suppose there are, I've picked out five reasons for this. The first of them is a subject called, a subject that I've had to learn quite a bit about in the last year or so, and that is lobbying. The banks are really, really good at it. They have incredibly deep pockets. Particularly in the US, they use their money to ruthless aims they are always, the financial services industry is always the largest contributor to the Republican Party and just the hedge their bets to the Democrats too. It's not just by a little bit, it's by a huge factor. They, they ensure that they have a very powerful voice uh, heard in Washington and in the White House. And they are constantly seeking to water down the most punitive aspects of regulation. So while that goes on, 
it's not it's never safe to relax secondly there is the lingering afterlife of shareholder value i mentioned the recent conversion to stakeholder value of the business round table in the us it's very recent I'm, I, for one, am watching very carefully to see whether these big business chief executives have really changed their mind or whether they're just saying what they think the world wants to hear. So let's watch that very carefully. Shareholder value is not dead. Thirdly, there is something, there is a, a propensity to still in business for what I call right to left planning. Right to left planning is where on the right, you say, OK, I want my profits in five years out to be X, and I want my return on capital to be Y. That's what it's going to be. And now what we'll do is we'll, we'll work back from that and find ways of, of, of delivering those numbers. It's a dangerous way to run a business. Better is left-to-right planning. Left-to-right planning works like this. OK, so here we have, here we have a business. We have our resources. We have these customers. This is the size of the market. This is the potential market share we might get. We can build a model if we do that, which will show profits of X and profits of Y. That shall be our target. So starting with the, the characteristics of the business and building to a profit number, a much more sensible and more responsible way to go than right to left planning. Right-to-left planning is still very common in the US and the UK. Fourth reason to remain vigilant is something that you, you, may, you may have heard of, you may not have heard of, open banking. This is a requirement that, and all banks are required to do this now, with your permission, only with your permission, banks have to share all of your all of your financial data with other banks and with other businesses. Now, the intention behind this is to increase competition in banking, to break down the very high market share in the UK of the big, of the big four banks. I understand that. I get that. I welcome that. There could be a lot of benefits from open banking. It could teach you to manage your money better. It could enable you to get a better deal. It could make it easier for you to switch from one bank to another. Lots of merits in that. But, also, but think back to the example of TSB that I gave a few, minutes ago, a few minutes ago. What happens if there's an error? What happens if your data is hacked, if it's accidentally leaked? This could be all over the place. So let's just, we, we, we welcome open banking, but let's be aware of the dangers. And I think a final reason why we ought to remain vi vigilant, it's, a, it's something that a, a, a veteran banking commentator, Christopher Fields, always says to me, and that is that the time of maximum danger is when the last person to remember the last crisis retires. <laughs> and we're already 11, 12 years after the banking crisis. There will be many of you sitting here who don't remember the queues around Northern Rock, for whom Gordon Brown's remarks about troops on the streets, potential riots, the cash points not working, will just seem like words. This happened. This nearly happened. There were queues around Northern Rock. You had to take a plastic bag to be sure of getting your money. The government was worried about bringing the troops on the streets. That's what can happen if banking goes wrong. Now, as Robert Peston said, without our banks, we have a rigid society. We don't have the social and economic fluidity that we all welcome. So it's a tricky balance to strike. Let's, let's remain vigilant. Let's not trust our banks blindly. Let's also recognise that we do have to trust them if we are to have the healthy, vibrant society that we all hope to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um,
my name is Nigel Wright. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation here at Nottingham Trent. Philip has kindly agreed to take questions, and we have two roving microphones. So who would like to kick us off with a question? One at the back there. I was there in, sort of, through those, that period in, in the banks working in London, and also I, I still work with the banks now around the senior manager and certification regime. I think we often talk about banks, but what we don't talk about is individuals, because a lot of those individuals that were there are still there. So the carols of this world, and I think, you know, when you, you, the commission talked about it'll take a generation to change, because I know from the culture, I, I, I'm there, I was there this, this year, the culture very much is very similar to as it was in 2007. Lots of different rules, I appreciate that, but I think we still have to be aware of that kind of moral compass, because if you're that way inclined, it's very, very difficult to change your, the person that you are, mm -hmm. your character. If you're, if you're dishonest, if you're a thief, if you don't have that, you know, you go and sell this PPI to people. I know from, I was in, I was in the, the industry at that time as well. If you had a moral compass, you didn't sell that mm. because you knew it, you knew all of the things, self-employed, retired, it wouldn't cover. But if you just blindly go in there and sell and make big bonuses and make money, whatever the target is. And the other thing within the industry, they'll find different ways of having targets mm. and league tables and bonuses. It'll be called something else. You can have as many rules as you like, but, you know, from my view, that's, uh, that's a potential worry. That's a, a really powerful contribution, and thank you, thank you very much for it. So if, would you, could I just respond very, very briefly? Um, let's, I'd like to respond what happens at, at grassroots level, at branch level, and what happens at the top, at the top of the banks. At grassroots level, you'll, you'll know if you worked in the industry, you go into the branch and it's, it, it's all very nice. There are probably iPads around the place. There might be a copy of the Financial Times. It's, it might be an old marble banking hall. It's very nice. If you open the door and get into this rather stuffy staff room, you'll find on the wall probably a whiteboard with every, everyone's name down the left-hand side, a list of products across the top, and everyone has got a target written by them. That was the world Carol occupied. One thing that has changed since the crisis, though, is that what's written across the top is no longer, um, it's no longer products, but it's behaviours. People are now asked to model different kinds of behaviour. There has been a change in the industry. Your point is very good, of course. If you're that way inclined, you can get round it. But they, are, they, but they are trying. Secondly, um, at the top, I just want to talk a bit about changing behaviour at the top of the organisation. One of the most extraordinary things about writing my book, The Bank That Lived a Little, of course, in the end, I had to, I had to show it to Berkeley's. Um, my publisher insisted on that. And I showed the section on Carl to one of the chief executives of the bank. And... He said, look, OK, it's all very interesting, but clearly you've made this up. I haven't made this up. I said, no, I haven't made this up. Why, why? I've changed the name, but I haven't made it up. This absolutely happened. Why, why do you think I would have made it up? And he said, well, none of our people would behave like this. You know, so this is a man, it was a man, at the top of an organisation that employs a quarter of a million people. How can he know what is going on at grassroots level? He can't. What you have to do is change the incentive structure, make people responsible, personally liable, financially liable, at financially at risk if they sell a product that goes wrong. So I think that has happened. It's a very powerful contribution. Thank you very much for it. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, cracking lecture. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Uh, would you prefer a hypothetical question or a practical one? Because I can't make my mind up. Fire away. We'll try the hypothetical one, though. Um, so I think I'm right in saying that a couple of weeks before um, the Northern Rock uh, queues, really major flooding, really, really major flooding. Um, and I've always had this theory that if um, the Northern Rock thing had kicked off at the same time as the floods, you definitely wouldn't have had the same volume <laughs> of people able to queue at the banks, and you probably wouldn't have had the same level of coverage on the news kind of prompting it. Now, I'm sure that the crisis and the leveraging and everything else would have unwound... It eventually, but in that, in that imaginary world that I've had stewing in my head for five years, how would you, expert, um, think <laughs> that that might have panned out without the same really highly visible, iconic catastrophe? 
And the second question? <laughs> Are we doing both? <laughs> um, the, the closest anyone seems to have come up with uh, as an alternative for banks is cryptocurrencies, which I would characterize as, at best, an unreliable form of gambling. Um, we're in an education institution. What can educators and other experts do uh, to help prevent people, I don't know, Emperor's New Clothes on some fool's errand? Yeah. I mean, financial education is a, is a, is a, a very pressing subject. There's a strong movement going on in schools to teach people how to manage their money. It's something that open banking potentially will, will, will help us to do. The banks could do quite a bit as well. I mean, I don't really want to get any more, any more thudding great documents from my bank telling me about how the credit card works. Simplify it. Just give me the main points, please. It's a huge communications exercise. Um, I'll think about the first question get back to you on that. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay, question up there, and then take one here. Uh, um, thank you for your lecture. It's a ver another very interesting one I enjoyed. Um, so just to sort of go back on the gentleman's behind me point about the lack of change in culture, um, we're now living in a time where interest rates are at an all-time low, and it's never been this cheap for banks to obtain any amount of money from the central bank at such a cheap rate. Um, but would you say that the lower interest rate times that we're living in is perhaps presenting a danger to actually increase the recklessness of the banks because it's never been easier to obtain such cheap money? And at the same time, it's a detriment to perhaps people in this building and the wider community uh, to um, put rely more reliance on debt as opposed to savings because the savings rate is just being eroded by inflation. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really good point. And you can, actually, you can actually see evidence of that out there in the marketplace. What is happening at the moment is that the banks are actually generating lots of cash. Um, there's, no, they, there's nowhere they can put it. There's nowhere they can invest it. They can't invest it in markets because, as you say, interest rates are about half a percent. So what they're doing, in fact, is um, making it available for people to borrow. And in the UK, we're seeing that particularly in the, mor in the mortgage market. So you can see the early seeds of the next crisis already building up as banks try to expand their market share it's just, um, and that's, that's actually an example, if you like, of right to left planning. <laughs> it's, it, we don't need to do that. Thank you. Question here. We talked about the banking philosophy. But, uh, what I'm concerned about is that the jobs, the more specialised and um, people are getting trapped in these jobs and, and also there's not much multi-skilled, there's not much organisation changes, there's more strict rules. Is that bad for the economy? Because people, when they go home, they're tired, depressed because they're doing the same thing and the productivity of the company, the banks, is not improving. But that's what we used to, you, you, you did say, that if banking collapses, the economy collapses, we have troops in. So mm -hmm. what has been done for contingencies or improve this specialism of jobs and more skilled? I know many philosophers like Charles Handy, you imagine good have made changes, but there's still we have a long way to go to for this. So the question was about specialism in the increasing specialism in finance and in banking, but actually you could apply this to any, to any sector, and there is a lot of that. I think there actually there is there is a degree of convergence going on. It's an interesting point. I haven't thought about it, but the convergence is actually around digital skills, and I think. Although there is specialism, there is often a specialism around a common digital skill core. And that, I think, actually is exportable from sector to sector. It was something that we wrote, that we thought about a lot in the post-18 education review in which uh, Professor Peck and I worked together. The need for people to effectively retrain, reacquire new skills regularly throughout their careers but actually it often boils down to having transportable core digital skills. So I, I maybe, it's a really interesting point, I'd like to think about it afterwards, but I, I, in, in, instinctively I'm, I'm less concerned perhaps than, than you are, but I'd like to reflect on that. Thank you.
Okay. One here. Um, you gave us okay. some examples of how things have changed since the last crisis, but I wonder if you were free to introduce any additional regulation yeah. you liked to give us slightly longer before the next crisis, what would it be? <laughs> well, <laughs> so how could, what, would you, what would you do to make things even, even safer? Okay. A lot of the things that are in place already are helping, so you make sure that the capital requirements that banks have to hold stay absolutely at these current levels. Resist, resist the lobbying. Stop, separate two activities which are, which are really inimical when they're put together. And these activities are serving customers in markets and in playing markets with your own capital. It's called proprietary trading. High-risk activity, very difficult to separate them. Interestingly, it was one of the first reforms introduced on Wall Street after the crisis. I cheered. It's something I've been writing about and arguing for a long time. Already, though, you can see Wall Street fighting back. That barrier is just being lowered and gradually being watered down. So capital, separation of conflicting activities, conflict of interest is, 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 a, real, is a real issue. I think there's one other thing that I, I, that, that I think could be done, and that is that when banks bring deals to the market, so I hope this isn't going to be too technical, but when banks, banks bring traded deals to the market, quite, they securitize the loans, they, they sell them on to other people, they should be required to keep some of those loans on their own balance sheet to make sure they have skin in the game. Safety, safety, safety all the way through. Thank you. Okay. Question there. Ethical banks are likely to be more trustworthy than other banks, and generally, what do you think of ethical banks? So the question was about um, ethical banks. Uh, I'm not actually sure that I know what ethical banks are anymore. Um, the most ethical bank, in some senses, was the co-op bank, wasn't it? Which st sort of stuck, at least in theory, to the, the principles of the Rochdale pioneers. It was... It, 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 it just wasn't able. It wasn't able to survive. Um, I, I just, if I, if I see ethical, if I see ethical bank, yeah, I'd, I'd want to look at the at the provenance of the of the provider of the service. If it's faith based, I would feel more comfortable. If it was a mutual society, so owned by members rather than by shareholders, I would I would feel more comfortable. But always I'd want to scrutinize, I'd want to check, I'd want to look at the difference between, I want to make sure that what they, actually, what the, what they do is what they actually say. It's very often there's, a, there's a, a, dis, a disconnect between the two. But the provenance of the provider, I think, would be the, the, probably the, the place to start. Hi, uh, thanks for the lecture, it was great. Um, <laughs> just wondering, when you say remain vigilant, how vigilant should we be? Like, how easy is it to roll back a lot of the regulations and changes in legislation that have happened over the last X many years to yeah. make us safer? Um, bearing in mind our current Chancellor of the Exchequer was selling the very loans that caused the, the crisis at yeah. the time. Yeah. How vigilant... Sorry. Yeah, how vigilant do we need to so be? How, like, how, we how to vigilant be should, we, should we be? So it's... It's what? It's... 11 years since the crisis. How much, is, how, how much is written in the three main English political manifestos is there about banking now? It's, it's not an issue anymore. It, just doesn't, it doesn't really feature. So that's one of the rules. The time of maximum danger is very, is very nearly upon us. As individual consumers, we need to be careful with our money. We need to read the small print. We need to avoid that we don't become a Carl. We need to look at the, as in response to the previous question on ethical banking, we need to look at the provenance of the provider. We need to have a healthy scepticism. But actually, the real responsibility for this lies with government, with government, with regulators, with, with officials. And that's where I, where I do worry that, that, that the, the influence, the lobbying influence, the lobbying power of the financial services industry is enormous. They have pretty much infinite resources on this.
and they're clever, they're persuasive. There is every reason for them to be, um, to, 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 to be defensive. It, it's, it's a real challenge. And I, I mean, it's, why, it's one reason to, really why I keep, I keep writing about banking, I keep speaking about it. Um, because actually, if, if people like me and people who are better than me, the Will Hotton and many other much better commentators, you know, we absolutely have to stay on the case. And it's really hard because the banks make it very, very difficult to, to criticise them. I, 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 after one of my books, um, I received a speaking engagement like this, which suddenly disappeared from my diary. And it turned out that a, um, a big bank had said to the organiser, you'd be better off not having this guy. You know, it's, it, it's, a really, it's really hard to stay on the case. Really hard. Okay. To what extent do you think you should look to put your savings and your money into other different avenues? For example, investment, uh, real estate and stuff like that. And do you think there are better options in this day and age or not? So that's really an investment question, isn't it? Um, and I'm, I'm, probably not, I'm probably not very well placed to, to answer that. Um, who is, is the question. Don't go to your financial advisor. <laughs> um, you know, you, it's, it's, it's always... The, you, you have to think long-term. You have to look for a balanced portfolio. You don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, it's the sort of it's the sort of sensible the sensible principles of of, 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 of of good household. Try not to buy at the top. You know, there's a really good there's a really good saying in the stock market actually. So you don't buy at the top, that's for sure. So you try and buy at the bottom. But how do you know when it's the bottom? And the, the really some really good investment advice I was given was don't try and catch a falling knife. Wait till it's hit the floor. Um, so I can't, beyond that, I can't really can't really go much further. Okay. There. Well, one could argue there's a relatively small number of banks chasing a relatively small number of yeah. profitable customers. Yeah. And I guess some of the protections you've talked about have put more barriers to entry in um, for that underserved, growing underserved community yeah. of, of, of people. And I'm just interested in how we, how we might reconcile that. How do we get banks to start to deliver services uh, to target that underserved community? I'm encouraged by I'm encouraged by the growth of really quite different challenger banks at the moment. They're very they're very very small, um, very small, they, and, and none of them are profitable at this point. But they are offering a different kind of service, um, app based, sophisticated ways to understand and, mani and manage your money. That that's going to make a, a difference, but it's going to be a long game because. Bizarrely, people, despite what can be a very poor service from banks, people in this country are very reluctant to change to change bank account. The often quoted statistic actually is that um, you're more likely to get divorced than to change your bank. It's it's you know there, there's there it's it's we're very very sticky. So we look to the challenger banks. We look to real competition, increasing competition between the big players. Um, and a lot, is down, a lot is actually up to the customers um, to be selective, not to just assume that the bank you, you joined when you were a, an undergraduate is, is yours for life. It's, it's good customer behaviour. It's hard, though, because it's very difficult to understand the pricing behaviour with free current accounts. You spoke about the, the sort of uh, changing in culture from mm. the shareholder-driven um, yeah. return that was sort of that was driving commercial yeah. banks. Since the crisis, have you uh, observed any uh, change in the composition of boards and how they approach um, the choice of a chief executive to set the sort of the culture within the organisation? Or has it maintained, in a sense, the status quo from, say, 2007, 2008? That is a really great question. That is a re and you've put, you've put your finger on one of the, one of the really big one of the really big issues, and it's a point I, tr I try and bring out in, my, in my, the Bank That Lived a Little book. I've written this as though you're in the boardroom with the participants. I interviewed you know, dozens, hundreds, hundreds of them. 
And the thing that comes out is that boards, have, boards, they all fish in the same gene pool. Boards recruit people like them. So they all think the same. They all act the same. In the financial services industry, they quite frequently talk about golf. They go shooting. They go to the opera. They like the same sports. It's a very, you know, they, they, it's almost like an identikit. I haven't really, and there, there is a certain, there, there is diversity in a sense in that the gender balance is, is, is evening up. But you know what? When I, when I look at the at, at women on banking boards, they still come from the same pool, actually, as the men. They, they do the same things. What we really need, I'd like to see more academics on boards. I'd like to see workers represented on boards. I'd like to see customer groups represented on boards. I think only when we have that will we have um, a really properly functioning system of corporate governance. Great question. Thank you. Um, thanks for the lecture. I think it was really, um, really fascinating to see your view. I... Um, I just wanted to bring up the kind of um, the piece around kind of criminal activity related to banking, um, since I don't think you touched upon that much at all. Um, obviously, HSBC um, came to light recently for helping um, drug cartels in Mexico launder mm. money, and that type of activity doesn't really appear much in the news. So I wanted to get your view on whether you, whether your perception was that that was just scratching the surface of what, what happens to come to light in the news or whether or not that's less frequent and wish, it, it's something that's kind of not really happening as much. So, thanks. So, the question was um, criminal activity, s sanction busting, laundering drug money, all, all the rest of it, fiddling interest rates, fiddling foreign exchange markets. Cases are going through the court. Um, so this is happening. Actually, I just detect there's been a, a slight slackening in media interest, actually. But it, 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 you know, there, there's only a certain number of times you can report the case of a LIBOR trader, and they've done it already. But it, it is still happening. There are, there are still live cases in the courts at the moment, which are, which are in fact sub judice, so I'm, I'm not going to comment on them. But it, it, it is still going on. But it's, it's, the, it's the, I just think there's a, a waning in public and media interest in the, in the, in the subject. Um, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was quite ha um, enlightening. But I just want to uh, get your views on the notion of shareholders. I mean, recognizing that shareholders essentially are the owners of the banks mm -hmm. and all the other institutions. Mm -hmm. And in more cases than not, it's the same pension funds that are actually investing in the banks, and they're the pensioners also that lose the money. If there isn't any value in holding um, shareholders to account for how the banks are run, particularly as they're actually the ones who are investing the money for the pensioners and the rest of the public. Okay, so this is the relationship between in share, shareholders, banks, and the, 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 world, the world at large. I don't, I'm not aware of any means of holding, that, holding them to account in the way that, in the way that you describe. But I think there's, there has been a real change in the, la, in the last 10 years. And the change, the change is that financial institutions, pension fund managers and the rest have built up corporate governance teams, specialists who actually look at corporate governance issues. And from that group of people, there is a lessening in the pressure to make money at all costs. There is much more interest in doing things the right way, avoiding the 400 billion of fines that I spoke about in the lecture. There is, there is, a, there is a change going on. But again, you, know, you have to stay ever vigilant. As the, as the fines get in, into the distant memory, the pressure will drop and, and bad behavior occurs. So it's the same old message, be vigilant but I know of no specific way that um, a grieved pension fund, um, pension fund recipients could actually hold shareholders to account for what happened in the banking crisis. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. I think you've shown us not only is the topic very important, but also a very interesting one. I've learned something that I'll take away that surprised me and I'll keep thinking about, and this is the concept that banks are a force for redistribution within society, which I hadn't really 
appreciated before. Um, and I think that reflects that many of us can at the same time have two opinions about the banks that are contradictory. So many might say, well, we don't trust banks, but the vast majority of us trust them with our money and we don't go to bed at night worrying that it won't be there uh, in the morning for most of the time. So I think you've, you've taken from that, it's an emotive subject which you've taken. You've presented some excellent evidence to us and I think with your insight from your experience you've been able to draw out of that and really give us some, conclusion, some conclusions that are incisive based on that evidence. So thank you very much. Sir Philip Orgo. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.